Welcome to our first virtual FAFSA night brought to you by Buncombe County Schools. We've got a lot of community and college partners with us tonight. We have um, CFNC is with us tonight, State Employees Credit Union. We've got AB Tech Community College folks here, and we have UNC Asheville. And we also have a very special program at um, Irwin High School Project Discovery. And uh, Jamie Beth Ferraro is with us from there. Um, Devin McCarthy is from CFNC. Many of your students, maybe you have been to a presentation with Devin before, and she's going to do our presentation about the nuts and bolts of FAFSA. Um, Betsy Boggs is a senior counselor from North Buncombe High School, and she's going to just give us a little talk from a parent and a veteran school counselor perspective because she has a senior this year herself. So she's been giving these talks all these years and, and now she's going through it just like you, you're about to do. Um, I've got Vicki McKelney and uh, Cody Woods from UNCA. Um, Fairly Patton is with us from Asheville Buncombe Tech, AB Tech. And from the financial aid department, we've got John Grunder, Ben Colburn, and Megan Triplett. Um, we've got Carla Eisenhower with the State Employees Credit Union. They're a wonderful partner. Even if you are not a member there, um, they are uh, available to help with financial aid and answer any questions. Um, we don't tend to think of them uh, as a partner, but they are definitely a state organization and a partner um, with our FAFSA efforts to get everybody to fill out the FAFSA. Um, I said Jamie Beth Ferraro, Christy Cheek, um, is Christy here yet? I know she was going to be here. She's with our Buncombe County Schools Foundation. They do a lot of wonderful projects for Buncombe County Schools, not the least of which is um, manage and offer a whole lot of scholarships that kids can apply for. And then all of our Buncombe County School staff, if you guys would just say real quickly who you are and what school you're from. I'm Betsy Boggs. I am one of the counselors at North Buncombe High School. I'm Lois Peterson. I'm one of the school counselors at Anka High School. Jennifer Kahn from AC Reynolds High School. I'm Buck Tanner. I'm one of the counselors from Owen High School. I'm Jenny Elks. I'm one of the counselors at TC Robertson High School. And Melanie Parham, I'm from T.C. Robertson High School. All right. I think Michelle Eldridge, I'm from T.C. Robertson High School as well. T.C. Robertson is in the house. I didn't even see you all come in, so thank you very much. Did, I, did we miss anybody? Did I miss anybody else? So this is our, our little agenda for you tonight. We're going to hear from Betsy in a moment. Then we're going to hear the nuts and bolts about FSA ID and, and filling out the FAFSA. And at the end, we'll do some questions and answer it, answers. Um, we'll turn the recording off then. And uh, we'll give you a little more information on who to contact. And we will send you on your way. And we will um, send the recording out to you later. So I don't. we don't have any other um, questions or introductions, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Betsy Boggs from North Buncombe. Thanks, Betsy. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm super excited for you all to be here tonight. We're excited to have this opportunity as a, as a county. I'm not just representing each individual high school alone. We do a lot of stuff um, at each high school. So it's really exciting to get us all together and put to together all the information that we have and know and our knowledge with the community and with the local colleges. So we're super excited that you guys are here. I have been working at North Buncombe High School since 2007. That's a super long time. And I have worked with lots of families and kids with their FAFSA. But uh, this is the first time I've um, been able to do it on my own with my own child that is a senior at TC Robertson. So it is super exciting to be, have had all of that knowledge to put into my experience with my own child. But it's also been an experience. It's kind of like um, changing your oil in your car uh, for the first time all by yourself because you kind of, you're getting in there and getting your hands dirty. So it's been a really great experience. And I feel like I've um, learned an awful lot about what it's like to fill out the FAFSA. So 
just kind of some of the things I wanted to share with you guys about is why is it important to fill it out? Some of the things that I have learned. Of course, we all know that it's a huge part of that college process, the two and four year. It's uh, something everybody tells you to do. It's, you know, we send it out and all kinds of information. You see it everywhere. But it also, it's important just to recognize that it's not just for that college experience. It does open up a lot of doors for um, the federal aid, um, the grants and the scholarships that come from that. But it's also something that the school can look at to provide their own things that they have within that building um, in the institution that they're able to offer you. And further, um, some more things that I have also learned, a lot of the high schools have one counselor that focuses and supports the scholarships um, within the community. And as your senior is filling out those scholarships, a lot of the um, community organizations or the, um, the groups of people that offer those scholarships, some of them actually ask for this student aid report. So it's important also to know that it's not just this federal aid thing. The student aid report goes to lots of different places. So there's a, a lot of different um, avenues that this student aid report that is um, a result of that FAFSA that is used in many different places. I wanted to share just a couple of things that I have learned um, along the way that are important that kind of made it go a little bit easier for me um, and for my uh, daughter as we are filling this out. The first thing and is the most important thing is ask questions. It is a big task to fill out the FAFSA. It takes time and it takes a lot of um, gathering your thoughts and things. So ask questions. If you're not sure if you have the right document, if you're not sure what you need, ask people. We are here tonight to answer those questions and to help support you. So please make sure you ask questions. Another thing that's important is to get all of that together, have that knowledge, and then have all of your documents ready to go. It makes that process of filling out the FAFSA go a little bit smoother when you have your tax information, you have your checking account information, you have um, your 529 information and you have all that together. It kind of helps that um, when you sit down together to fill out that FAFSA, it goes a little bit more smoothly. And with saying that, make sure your kid is a part of it. It is a big deal. There is a lot of stuff that the parent has to fill out but it's important for your student to be a part of that process. It is them, that child that you're sending off to college. So it's, you want them to be a part of that process as well and be there. Um, another thing that we found out that was important too is when you're filling out the FAFSA, your, your, your student puts in their email and that student aid report gets emailed to the student. It does not come to the parent email so making sure that you have that communication going on and the student knows that they are looking for that because that's where that goes. Um, and, they, and for them to be looking for that email to come. And then one of my last things to point out is just to be patient. It does take time. It takes some um, energy to put all that stuff together. So be patient, ask questions, and it'll all come together and, and you'll find out lots of information for this process. That's a huge step, that post-secondary um, planning. So that's just kind of some of the tips and from a parent, um, not just a counselor. So yeah, thank you. So, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, it, it is a different perspective, isn't it? Once you've been through it a time mm -hmm. and or a time or two. Um, so I really, I really appreciate hearing from you. Um, <clears throat> so next on our agenda, um, we're going to let Devin McCarthy is our CFNC rep. Co CFNC is our College Foundation of North Carolina. She serves all of our schools and does an amazing job. Um, you may have, like I said, you may have been to one of her presentations at the high school or one of her um, virtual events, and we're so happy to have her here with us. She is going to share her screen next. So, um, Devin, just take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for that perspective, Betsy. That was great. And you said like a lot of really important things. So I feel like you can do this presentation for me. I love it. 
<laughs> You've learned a lot. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about the FAFSA, some of the nuts and bolts, you know, what do you need to do? Um, you know, what are the, some things to keep in mind as you're going through this process? Um, just a general overview. Um, and then we have obviously a number of experts. So as I'm talking, feel free to put questions in the chat. And, you know, of course, we'll have some time um, after I talk uh, for you to ask questions um, in addition to that. So first and foremost, it's important to note that it is the free application for federal student aid. You should never have to pay money uh, to apply for federal aid, to apply for any financial aid. Um, and so that's really key. Sometimes people are a little confused that maybe they have to pay for this. You do not. It's absolutely free. It's a free federal program. And so why complete it? Um, Betsy Boggs just told us a bunch of really great reasons to fill it out. Um, and really any discussion of why filling out the FAFSA, you know, you really have to start with all the costs of college, right? You have to understand, you know, what you're paying for and what you're trying to find financial aid for through the FAFSA. So you're not just necessarily paying for tuition and fees, but you're also paying for room and board, right? If it's, if you're living on campus, you're paying that bill to campus as a direct cost. But even if you're not living on campus, even if you're going to a community college, you're still paying for room and board while you're going to school, right? Um, so that's something you need to take into consideration when you're you know, paying for college, all of the costs of college. And then of course, you're gonna have books and supplies, transportation, all sorts of just life expenses. And so all of those direct costs that get paid to the college and the indirect costs that are still considerations for, you know, paying down while you're going to school, they all combine to create your budget, which is called the cost of attendance. And you can find that on any college's website. And so I highly recommend you start there and just understand what different colleges colleges cost. Um, and that is one of the big reasons to fill out the FAFSA, right, is to try and find funds to bring down some of those costs. The cost of college, even within the state of North Carolina, can really vary widely from school to school. Um, but even, you know, at the community college, yes, the tuition is lower, but you still have to make sure that you're affording your life expenses. And so filling out the FAFSA, it does help you to qualify for aid from a number of different sources um, and in a, a number of different kinds of aid. So you may qualify for gift aid. So that's that free money. That's what everybody loves to hear about in scholarships or grants. You might qualify for self-help aid um, in work study. So that would be, a, that's a federal program where you can qualify for a job um, where you get a little bit money, get money for that. Or you might qualify for loans um, to help bring down some of those college costs. And you can receive aid from so many different sources. So of course, we talk about FAFSA being the federal form, right? And certainly the federal government has aid to offer to students who qualify, but then there's state grants and scholarships. So there's, there's money that the state may be able to add on to your uh, financial aid package based on the FAFSA information. There's also money from the colleges based on your FAFSA information. You might qualify for some funding that they have on that campus. And then of course, private scholarships might want that information information to see if you qualify for, you know, a need-based um, aid from a, a private scholarship. So it can go a number of different places. It's <clears> also <throat> worth mentioning that some colleges, before they award their merit aid, so meaning, you know, any scholarship money that somebody might get for academics or a talent or things like that, before that they, they award that to students, they want to see that students have filled out the FAFSA, okay? So just know that this can cover a range range of things that you might qualify for if you have your FAFSA filed. So who should complete it? I mean, in my opinion, any student who's thinking about going to college, whether it's a two year or four year, um, you know, any student should really fill this out and see what you qualify for. One big reason that I recommend that is that you're not committed to anything by filling out the FAFSA. Um, it's you, you may receive an offer of aid, but that doesn't commit you to anything. 
Okay, so just knowing what you can get and what you can afford is really, really helpful for this process. Many high school students at this point are considered dependents. Um, and so most students will need a parent to fill out the FAFSA with them. Now, some students may be independent and not need a parent's information, but there are questions on the FAFSA to help you figure out if you qualify as an independent student or if you're going to need a parent to fill it out with you. And these are the questions that are coming from the FAFSA. We've simplified them a little bit, but that this is what the questions are. So to determine FAFSA dependency status, meaning do you need a parent to fill this out with you? If you answer no to these questions, you're likely going to need a parent to complete these with you. Okay. So you're going to answer no if you are under 24, if you are um, single, if, if you are just looking for an undergraduate degree, like a bachelor's or an associate's, things like that. If you don't have any children um, that you're supporting more than 50%. And then there's some other questions. Sorry, there's two slides for this. <laughs> um, and then there's some other questions with a bunch of different scenarios. Um, these, are, these are fairly rare though. Like I said, most students will need a parent to help fill out this process. But for instance, if you were um, a homeless student, an unaccompanied youth, things like that, you know, obviously in those kinds of situations, you might be qualified as an independent student and not need your parents' information. And so if you do need your parent to complete this with you, the other thing I get asked pretty frequently is, you know, who should do this with me? And so there's a couple of scenarios to consider, right? So um, biological or adoptive parents, um, either one can fill that out for you if they're still living together, married or unmarried. So if those parents are living in the same domicile, um, either one of those parents can do this process with you. Um, if you have a single parent, they can do this with you. Um, the question we get a lot is separated or divorced parents. So if your parents are separated or divorced, and not living together, then you want to decide which parent you the, the student lives with most often for the last year, basically. Um, and, you know, it gets a little bit tricky then because sometimes it's a 50-50 situation. Well, you know, I live with both my parents equally. In that case, you really have to parse out, you know, who provides the most financial support for that student. And that should be the parent that fills out that FAFSA. And if one of those parents has remarried, that step parent is also going to be included um, with that, that FAFSA. If that parent who's filling out the FAFSA has remarried, that's going to be included on the FAFSA as well. So the timeline, um, you know, my, my best advice is, you know, do it as soon as, as you can. Um, if you you haven't done it yet, start to make plans to do it soon, right? Um, it opens October 1st each year for the following school year. So like for where next um, fall of 2021, um, it opened on October 1st in 2020. So that'll happen every year because it's an annual application. So you need to fill out the FAFSA for every year you're seeking aid for school. Okay, so unfortunately, it's not a one shot deal. You don't just do it and goes away. You got to do it next year. The good news is it does generally get easier from year to year, because you, after you've done it the first time, there's a lot of information um, that you can kind of pull over from the previous year. And know that college deadlines will vary. Um, from college to college. Um, everybody's timeline is, is a little bit different, um, but certainly you want to qualify for as much aid as you can, so earlier is best. Um, part of the reason I say that is because some funding is, um, it, it runs out um, after a period of time. There's only so much to go around and it's first come first serve. So, you know, the sooner you're in that line for that aid, um, the better your shot is of getting that aid. And we always want you to get any money that you might possibly qualify for. So let's talk about the nitty gritty. Um, what should you do? How do you do it? And I know Betsy gave us some really great tips on how she handled this process. And I could not agree more with what she said. So the first thing I would suggest is creating your account and having that account information ready to go. 
it can take up to three days for your information to be verified for your account to become like sort of official. So, you know, doing that ahead of time can can save some time and in in frustration in the process. And gathering your information, having a, knowing what you need and having everything in front of you before you get going can save, again, some time, some headaches, you know, in that process. When you complete the FAFSA application, it's great if you can have, you know, sort of your, your parent and the student together to do it together. Um, that is probably the best case scenario. If not, you know, a parent can do it um, separately from the student, but I, I really think it's helpful to have everybody sort of sit down together and, and do it together. And then once you're done, after you've submitted the FAFSA application, make sure to check for that student aid report. That's going to have a lot of important information from the FAFSA about what you filled out and next steps and information about the results of that FAFSA. And then my last recommendation is just to follow up with any additional inf information is needed. So if you find out that there's a request for additional information or you have further questions, you know, reach out to that financial aid office and, and really make sure that you're communicating um, with, with the financial aid office. They really are there to, to help you. So where can you find all this good stuff? You're gonna go to, you can go to a couple of different places actually. I like to go to studentaid.gov um, because that's the parent site. So that's like the, the federal aid site and it has lots and lots of information about the different kinds of aid that are available. And there's a link to the FAFSA application on there. If you wanna go straight to the FAFSA, you can go to fafsa.gov. Notice the common element there though is .gov. You always wanna be at a .gov site to make sure you're on the free government application site. You can also download a free app, the My Student Aid app, which is great. You can create your FSA ID, which is your account. You can complete your application on there, sign it. Um, so you can do the whole process on your phone if that's easier for you. So like I was saying, though, I, I do think it's a good idea to start that account before you start the application. That's the, the best way to do it. So it makes things go a little bit more smoothly. So the way to do that, you can go to studentaid.gov and you can see I took a little screenshot of what that screen's going to look like. And you're going to click on create account. That's going to take you to the FSA ID creation site. Or you can go directly, you can type in FSA ID.ed.gov. And either way, it'll take you to the FSA ID, the, the account creation site. So that FSA ID is your account, your login with the federal government for student aid purposes. Um, and it also serves as your signature, as your secure electronic signature at the end of the FAFSA application. So it serves a few purposes, um, but it's really, really helpful to have. And the student is going to need one, right? The student, because it's their application, they'll need to create their own FSA ID, but also the parent is going to need one. If it's a dependent student and the parent has to fill one out. Now, if you're a parent who had a student go through this process before and you've already created an FSA ID, you're going to use that same FSA ID for this next child. Once you create an FSA ID that's tied to you and your social security number. So similarly, if you're a parent and you've you know filled out the FAFSA with your, your child and then you decide you want to go back to college, you're still going to use that same FSA ID. Um, so it doesn't matter exactly what angle you're coming at the FAFSA from, it's always going to be that same FSA ID that's tied to you um, and your social security number. And this is just what it looks like. So you need to have your social security number there available to you. Make sure to double check that it's accurate because that's, you know, obviously how they tie you, and verify you to your information. Um, and then I do recommend if you can provide a phone number, a mobile phone number and an email address that, that is used for contact purposes, certainly, but it's also very helpful that you enter those, both of those in there in case you forget your password or your login at some point in the future. It just makes it easier to recover that information. <clears throat> And you get to create your own username and password. So you pick something that you'll remember and pick in and or save it somewhere where you can find it. That's going to be important because, again, you're going to use it every year to do this process. Um, and now we get to what do you need? OK, so what are you going to need? So because it's for the student but also uses the family's information, you're gonna need information for both the student and the parent that's filling out the FAFSA. 
So you'll need personal in, in identification information. You know, some of this you'll know off the top of your head, right? Your full legal name you're going to need. You're going to need your, um, your home address, things like that. And then other things you want to make sure you have correct, like your social security number. Um, if you are, um, if, if you are an eligible non-citizen, you want to have those, that documentation as well. Uh, if you have a driver's license, you want to have that on hand. If you don't have a driver's license, that's okay. You can still fill this out, but it does ask you for a driver's license. Um, and then if there's, you know, you might want to have the date of parents, marriage, separation or divorce, um, if any of that is applicable. Um, for instance, remarriage, you know, if, if you've recently been remarried or there's been a change in your marital status, um, and then of course, you know, separation or divorce, and then a list of the colleges the student is applying to. You can um, list up to 10 colleges at a time on the FAFSA. So I do recommend listing any and all colleges you're thinking about applying to. And then the financial information. And this is this is what, what makes people nervous, but it's not nothing to be nervous about. The nice thing about the FAFSA application is there's little question marks um, next to the different questions that you can hover over or click on and it gives you a little bit more information. So sometimes that can be very helpful to let you know exactly what they're looking for. Um, but you're going to need to have this information again for students and parents. You're going to need income for two years prior to enrollment. So for this year, if you're looking to enroll in 2021, the fall of 2021, that means you would need 2019 income information. You can find that on your taxes. Um, you can get your tax returns from the IRS. You can get it from your tax preparer. I use TurboTax. I could log in and just pull up my taxes from there. That's a really easy way to find it if you use a service like that. Um, and then you're going to want to see if you have any records of untaxed income. Some kinds of untaxed income might be if you receive child support payments or um, alimony or if you receive some kind of benefits, um, government benefits that aren't taxed. Um, and then you're going to look at assets. That's the other piece of documentation that you want to have handy. So, um, and this is a little bit different from the income. So note this part. The assets is as of the day that you click submit on the FAFSA, what are your assets? So you're going to need to look at, you know, what do you have in checking savings? You know, what do you have saved um, or put aside? And then report it, other assets, other investments. Um, but you don't have to report retirement accounts, which is great. <laughs> don't report, report your retirement accounts. You're not going to touch that for college. Um, businesses, you, you do have to report a large asset kind of business, but a small family business that's under 100 employees that does not need to be reported on the FAFSA. Um, you don't need to report uh, a small family farm. Like if you, your family lives on a, a farm, um, you know, you don't need to report that unless that's a, a larger investment type farm. So those are some things to just note about that. Like Ms. Boggs mentioned, you, you 529 accounts, college savings accounts, all those things, all those investments. And, and savings accounts. Those are the kinds of things you want to gather together and have records of when you get started. Is there anything I can do to make this easier? Well, yes, I'm glad you asked. So the data retrieval tool is going to be your best friend if you're eligible. Um, I cannot say enough good things about this because if you qualify, um, meaning you, you filed your 2019 taxes like for this year um, and you have a qualifying tax um, tax filing status, you can bring your tax information over directly from the IRS and you don't have to enter it by hand, which can save you a lot of time and hassle, which is great. And so this is kind of what that screen looks like. You can see a link to IRS right here and it'll ask you for your FSA ID. Um, my biggest advice here though is make sure to enter your information uh, to link up to the IRS exactly how it shows up on your tax return. So down to the level of the address, um, you know, just double check, like if you put, if you wrote out your address as Lane, L-A-N-E, write out Lane again, just to make sure, because it, it's a computer recognition system. So we want to make sure it syncs up the best way possible. So just to have your, have your tax returns next to you while you're trying to do the data retrieval tool, just so you can make sure what you enter looks exactly the same. And hopefully that'll just sync up and it'll be a lot easier for you. Students and parents can use this. And the other reason I recommend using it is because if you can pull your information from the IRS, that information has already been verified and it just reduces the chances that you'll have an 
another added step of verifying any information that you've entered in there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it reduces the chances you'll have to submit paperwork afterward. So how do I know I've submitted successfully? Well, you should see a confirmation page right after you submit. So one thing that I always mention to folks is make sure to sign and submit. So sign with your, your FSA ID and then make sure you click submit so that you've done both of those things at the end of that application. And then this information should come up and that should let you know that you've successfully submitted. Um, it's got some basic information about next steps, you know, what happens next. It tells you that the student aid report will be sent to you. We're going to show you an example of that in a second. It gives you an estimate of what your EFC is. We're also going to talk about that. Don't worry. But this is all really important information. So you want to look for that to receive that right after you click submit. And that goes to the student email on file. If I didn't mention it before, students um, use a personal email, not a school email, because once you graduate, that school email goes away. Um, so student aid report, this comes, you know, about a week or so. Um, it says seven to 10 days on that confirmation page. It comes to a link to it comes to the student email. Um, I recommend keeping a copy of this for your records. This is a very important document for financial aid. This is what we were talking about before, where we said we can share some, some documentation with private scholarships that are asking for it. They may ask for this report. Um, and there's a few things that you can do. And I recommend that you do when you receive this. The first thing is all the information you put in your FAFSA is going to be listed below this um, front page. And so the first thing I think you should do is just glance through it, make sure everything looks right because it shows exactly what you entered. And so you can catch any errors like early on by just glancing at that and double checking. The next things I want you to look for, um, this top section here, right in the like kind of top middle, that will tell you whether you've it appears complete, it's been submitted, it might tell you if you need additional information or if something doesn't look right. Um, so look at that. And then it also um, tells you if you've been selected for verification, which is that process where you might need to submit some documents to a financial aid office. So verification, don't panic if you're selected. About 30% of all FAFSAs are selected each year. Um, and it's just to verify the information that you put on, on the FAFSA application. So it's not going to ask for anything wildly strange. Um, it's going to ask for those documents that you gathered in order to complete the FAFSA. Okay. And so if you do get selected for verification, my best advice is to just reach out to the financial aid office of the colleges you're applying to or the main college you're applying to start with them first um, and just ask them how, you know, what they need um, for you to send to them and how they need it sent. And, you know, you can kind of take care of that process. I recommend though, that you definitely check this for that information though, because you're application, your financial aid process is on hold until you finish verification, until you submit those documents. So you just want to do it in a timely fashion, but there's no need to stress about the process. It's nothing unusual. Um, hopefully you won't be selected and you won't have to worry about it, but if you are, don't stress about it. And then the last thing I want you to look for is up here, this is going to be your expected family contribution. Okay. And so this is an important number from the FAFSA. This is sort of the results of your FAFSA. And so this is what that is, okay? So the FAFSA takes all that information that you've given to it and it has calculations that it performs and it comes up with um, an, an estimate, an expected parent contribution. So what a parent could reasonably, you know, afford to spend on their child's college education in a given year. They divide that by the number of students in college. So if you have multiple students going to college, they'll divide that up. And then they add that to the student's expected contribution as well. And that comes out to the EFC, the expected family contribution, which again, is just the amount the, by the federal government's calculations that your family can reasonably be expected to pay for college in a given year. Okay. And so the reason that's important, that amount is because it's used by the financial aid offices to help, you know, determine what you qualify for in aid to start that process. So they take that cost of attendance that we talked about earlier in this presentation, they subtract the EFC and that what's left over is a student's eligibility for need-based funds. Okay. So that's kind of where this process starts. Um, you know, and this is, it's just important to know the workings behind that and exactly what, what is going on with the FAFSA. So this is where it goes and this is how it's used. 
So let's talk about it, just a few quick FAFSA tips. Um, you know, definitely double check that you're filling out the FAFSA for the correct enrollment year. At any given time, there's generally two FAFSA applications open. Um, and so you want to make sure you're selecting the one that lists the year that you're seeking aid for, so the enrollment year. So right now, if you were to go on, you know, you you want to select that 2021 to 2022 school year if that's the year you're seeking aid for. Double check that your information is correct and matches other documentation. Like I said, legal name, you know, just make sure everything looks and matches up with everything so that you just avoid delays in the process. Um, you know, add any and all schools that you're thinking about applying to. It does not hurt to add a school that you don't end up applying to. Um, you know, so just add any of those schools. And if you decide to add a school later in the process that you didn't put on your FAFSA, you can go back and add it later. Okay, so just make sure you get those schools on there. Check your school's websites for specific FAFSA priority deadlines, um, deadlines that might be out there. Report any uh, uh, un any qualified untaxed income. That's something that people often forget to do. So just make sure you, you submit all that. Um, sign and submit the two-step process. And then my biggest thing is just keep checking your email, right? You're gonna get um, that student aid report. If you haven't seen your student aid report in, in a week or two max, I would log into FAFSA again and just to check on that and make sure, you know, see, make sure what's going on, make sure to troubleshoot anything that might be needed. Um, I also recommend checking your email just frequently throughout this process because a lot of the emails from colleges and, you know, financial aid offices and things um, you know, are important and time sensitive. So definitely make sure you're checking that. Now, this is a big question I get lately. Um, you know, what if our financial situation has changed or we have something, you know, special, a special circumstance that's just not accounted for, um, not accounted for on the FAFSA. And, and that, that's true, that that does happen. Um, not everything you know, that exists in a family's financial realm can be documented 100% on the FAFSA. In particular, lately, we're hearing that some folks have lost their job. And so their income is different than it would have been in 2019, right? So that, that, that's going to be not quite as accurate on the FAFSA um, as, you know, more current information, right? So you want to call the financial aid offices of the institutions you're applying to, to talk to them about whatever situation you have going on. Um, you know, they may be able to um, apply something called professional judgment. They may be able to help you um, with that situation and, and modify that financial aid award. Now, if they can do that, though, they're definitely going to need um, an explanation and they're going to need documentation, third-party verification of what's, what that circumstance is. So my best advice is definitely communicate with your financial aid offices and hold on to any documentation related to your finances. Um, and that, so that way, if they need that documentation, you can supply that. And so there's some FAFSA resources out there. There's a ton of resources. There's a lot of resources on this Zoom call tonight. There's a lot of really fantastically knowledgeable people here tonight. So definitely take advantage of that. However, you know, there's other things that are out there as well. If you check out CFNC, we've got a bunch of FAFSA resources, a bunch of short videos to help you with the process, which is great. Um, and then we also have just other general, who do I contact? How do I find help with your FAFSA? I mean, a good Good rule of thumb is calling financial aid offices um, that are nearby or of the colleges that you're applying to. Um, but if you need to also, you know, kind of do some research and you're just not sure where you're applying yet or something like that, and you just want to talk to somebody, there's also this local assistance map. So you can actually um, click on that, click on your area and get connected with financial aid professionals in your, in your region. Um, and as Suzanne mentioned earlier, the state employees credit union, there are just so many people out there that really want to help you through this process. So please, if you are super confused and you need help, do not suffer in silence. We have got you. <laughs> we want to help. So definitely reach out and, and let us know how we, how we can help. And that is about it from my presentation portion. So. Wow, that that was fabulous. Um, we we had a lot of folks asking some great questions in the chat, and um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Get back in here. Um, <clears throat> so.
So if you didn't get all your questions answered or you, you just need some more, um, more in-depth help and you, you think of questions later, we like to think that your first stop is your school counselor. Your school counselor either has the answer for you or they know how to find it or point you in the right direction. If you um, really uh, like Devin's presentation and think that's, that's the person I want to talk to, she has left her um, information here for you, her email. We also have with CFNC, they have a general um, information email, which is listed there. And they also have a 800 number, it's 866 number. And they're open Monday through Thursday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Fridays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Your college or university financial aid office, if you know where you're going to go, you can contact them. But here's the thing about college um, and university financial aid offices. They are so excited about financial aid for students that they will help whoever walks in the door or calls them. You don't even have to attend that college. So if you feel like um, you've got a college up the street and it's a little closer and you want to go and maybe make an appointment or ask them for some help because um, your school's farther away, you can do that and they will be so excited to help you with that. Um, you can also go, just like Devin said, to the studentaid.gov site and there's a lot of good information there. Just like with CFNC, there's videos, there are um, uh, tutorials, there uh, are little infographics to show you step by step what to do for all kinds of questions. And we've had some interesting questions in the chat, um, some really difficult situations. Um, maybe um, Ben would want to answer some of that about the, the passwords and that's, that's not an uncommon thing, especially if you have other other kids in the household who've had an FSA ID, um, but I was following in there and folks were asking when could they um, find out about um, when, when would they get their financial aid packages. So if uh, anybody on our panel um, wants to pick a question and answer it or maybe answer a question that um, was already answered, but you thought it was a good one to share, just hop on in here. And, um, and, and ask, answer it for us. I'm going to try to go and see. I can talk to that one just a little bit. So what I've learned about the financial aid packages too, is that some, depending on the school, each school is going to be, do their own thing. Some schools send out just a financial aid package along with any um, awards you might be receiving, like scholarships that, um, that we were talking about earlier that is just part of the application or that you may have applied to directly to that institution. But also some schools send out those things differently. So you might get a package that is the award package and then later get the financial aid package. So it's just um, having that conversation, call the school, like I said earlier, ask questions. They will tell you, call the financial aid office, call the scholarship office, call the admissions office, and they can tell you about when to expect those, if it's one letter, if it's two letters, um, and they'll help you with that. Yeah, and just, to, just to chime in on that, John Grunder, AB Tech, um, with the college perspective, you will see a different um, response from each institution you apply to. Uh, we all approach financial aid with a slightly different uh, packaging philosophy. So your universities uh, want to want to shore up who's going to be attending a little earlier in the year. Your community colleges are more open-ended uh, and open access institutions and will accept applications year round. So really be careful and uh, just ask the schools that you're interested in attending and they'll be able to provide you the most accurate information. We'll keep up with a few more questions. I want to um, go to the next screen in case you all want some more contact information. Everybody that's here tonight, our um, AB Tech Financial Aid, UNCA, if you guys want to get a screenshot of this. Um, Christy Cheek, I spoke for you earlier, Buncombe County Schools Foundation, and I noticed you're on here if there's anything you'd like to say. Um, Carla Eisenhower with the State Employees Credit Union and Jamie Beth Ferraro with Project Discovery. So. Everybody's email is here if you would like to contact somebody. 
Uh, my name is Suzanne Gavanis. Um, I didn't say that at the beginning, but I am in student services at the district office, and um, I'll send my contact information out when we send the follow-up email with the video. So, so someone's asking about three different 529 accounts for three kids who will overlap some of their time in college. Will the FAFSA look at consider all three for my oldest, even though the other two accounts are in the other kids' names? What, does somebody want to take that question for us that's had a little more experience with that? John, how about you? <laughs> I think that because they're in the each individual child's name, they are not going, they're only going to consider that for each each child. Though you can share those 529 accounts between the kids. So I'm, I'm not 100% on that one. So in my, in my experience, um, and I, I do not have a lot of experience with 529s, but they're looking for total assets. Okay. That's, that's generally what they're, what they're looking for. They want to make sure they're including uh, in the FAFSA calculation all of the assets that the family has available to help provide for college. So I wouldn't, I would, I hate to say it, I'd include them all. I, I was going to say that same thing. Um, my understanding is because it's a, considered a parent asset, even though the students are different beneficiaries, it's still a parent asset. Um, and so that's, it's it, the, the whole, any and all 529 accounts would be considered parent assets on the FAFSA. Some, some of these type of questions, I would really encourage if you have a financial advisor, because they may have some specific advice around that, that um, would be for you and your family. That would not be, a, a, you know, advice for everyone. So, so they will include other kids' accounts, yes. Sounds like they will. Um, Okay, so I think at this point, um, another couple of questions that were asked were around the, um, the FSA ID and getting um, locked out. Do you, John, do you want to talk about that too? Or was it Ben that was answering those questions? That might have been Ben. Ben, can you speak briefly about that in case other parents run into that? Yeah, sure. Can, can you guys hear me right now? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, the FSA ID can be, uh, unfortunately, a, a, an obstacle right at the beginning. Um, we've had sometimes of a student and parent, because a student and the parent, as Devin pointed out, each need one. Other students in the household may have them. Sometimes people use the wrong social for the parent with the same name or mix the socials up, or they're trying to use the same one. Um, and if you're unable to recover that, um, using usually you're verifying a phone number or an email when you set it up. If you can't recover it, the challenge questions may unlock it for you um, and lock you out for about an hour before it lets you back in. So if you recover it with a challenge question, you have to give it some time before it will let you in. But calling the FAFSA help desk, or the FSCID help desk, um, and submitting the uh, recovery, the ID recovery, is going to be your last, you know, you'd still want to do that. There may be some things uh, you have to do later on. If you want to access the studentaid.gov website to look at all of your enrollment or loan history, maybe fill out the promissory notes or entrance counseling for loans, you probably need that ID to do that. So you, even though you can submit your FAFSA initially without the ID by submitting the signature page, you can't import your tax data. So you may have to submit that to the financial aid office afterwards, after the FAFSA arrives. And um, it just, it creates a little more work for you down the road, but you can still do it and then try to recover your FSA ID if you need to do the requirements for loans on the um, Department of Ed website. So, um, and if you need any, you know, like for instance, we will be glad to help a student if they need to fax something or send some information to the uh, FSA ID help desk to do that. We, we, we facilitated students in doing that before as well. Yeah, I just cannot stress enough how uh, hanging on to those things year after year after year and having a secure place, um, whatever works for your family that you can, you both have access to, um, 
parents, you'll have the same FSA ID for all your kids. Students, if you go to school for two years and take a break for five and you come back, it's going to be the same FSA ID. So um, you want to hang on to that. Um, parents, you know, it's, this is the transition year, but believe it or not, you're you're letting them go and they're flying the coop. And at some point in their college career, they're going to be sitting at their either in their, you know, their house off campus or at a college somewhere and they're working a job and they're going to be doing their part all on their own. And you're going to be sitting in your home doing your part all on your own. And so this is that year when you kind of all do it together. But at some point, that's why um, that is your student's account. They um, very soon, if they're not 18 yet, they will be, and, um, and this is their account, and you are transitioning to the coach role in, in all this financial aid stuff with your kids. And it's hard, but, um, but it's worth it down the road. Somebody asked, um, I wanted to get to this too before we moved on, about their son has yet to decide on attending college after graduation. They mentioned he mentioned taking a year off or what we would call a gap year. Um, would he still be eligible for FAFSA? You are eligible for FAFSA every year. No matter if you're an old lady like me or whatever, you're, all, you're always eligible, but you have to fill out a new one every year. So it's only every year. So your kids are going to, they're going to um, get into college and start in August or September, whenever it is. And the next thing you know, August rolls around and they, you will start this process all over again. So um, it gets easier every time. Um, just like with everything in life, the, the first time through is uh, the hardest, I think. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to actually tack on there um, for a second, Suzanne. Because I think what a lot of folks don't realize, particularly when, when your child turns 18, goes to college, we are obligated at the, at the college and university level to, to treat them as adults. And that means we cannot, in many instances, release information to the parents. So it is absolutely critical that you have a good communication with your kid, um, that, that they understand they have an obligation, they have a responsibility to continue to check their communications and to be prepared and communicative with the college or university they're attending. Um, it's just so critical. And I really just wanna make sure everyone's aware it's, it's going to be their responsibility. Yeah. Even though the federal government expects parents contribute to their child's college education, there is that expectation. But um, that, that magic number 18 for better or worse means um, with their health care, you know, you'll, you, everything, um, communication goes directly to the student. Um, some colleges, maybe most colleges, I can only speak from my experience, have some things that you can sign if, you're, if your student will give you permission to um, have access to. So that's, that's actually a really good point. Um, there's a lot of regulatory uh, discussion about this right now. And some institutions are electing not to allow release forms, just so you're aware. Wow. So never, never mind, but it has been the practice at many colleges, but that's, yeah. Um, for those of you that had such a hard time with your logins and passwords, uh, I, I think you, if you want some follow up later with that, um, I think that you've been given um, some, some good information here, but it sure sounds frustrating for some of you who are doing your due, di due diligence to make that work. Um, I don't know, guys, do we want to... Um, cut this off now and, and talk about, do we, anybody else see any questions? My co-hosts and panelists, do you see any questions that you'd like to bring um, out for the good of the group off of chat before I turn the recording off? You know, some students uh, may be eligible for financial aid, but their parents may not have a social security number. And yes, you can still complete a FAFSA using all zeros in the parent social security field. Um, <clears throat> if you would like to um, 
go into a breakout room with either our AB Tech folks or our four-year college UNCA folks, if that's something you're interested in doing, a breakout room is like a smaller Zoom room. And I would need for you to go back to that, those three little dots and um, put either a two or a four in front of your name if that's something you're interested in. Um, so I gave an example here. So actually I put it at the end, but it might be more helpful if you put the two in front of your name, just so we um, make sure that it shows. If you'd like to be contacted for some individual help, maybe you wanna get all your paperwork together and you would like one of these um, knowledgeable folks that have been on here today to contact you and follow up. We, you just didn't get everything answered or you think of something later. Please um, put your name and contact information. You can put it privately to the host or the co-host. Um, I think that if you have a counselor um, that you recognize and you want to send it to your, um, counsel your student's counselor, you can privately message them with your contact. Or if you would look for Jamie Beth Ferraro on there, she's going to, um, oh good, she should put a two in front of her name. She's gonna collect, um, if you wanna talk to anybody else here and you, you're not sure who, um, just put your name and contact, and maybe what school that your child attends. If you wanna have someone call you tomorrow to talk in more detail about some of these questions. Um, this will go out, I'm gonna turn this off right now. Um, this is the end of our presentation, and then we'll see um, who would like to go into a breakout session with our presenters. You all did a fabulous job. Uh, the folks here, parents and students, your questions were amazing. You really kept us on task. You asked some good questions, some that come up a lot and some that don't. But remember, if you ask a question, somebody else probably has the same issue. So you're helping somebody else. So we appreciate that. So thanks for coming out.